communication is always going to be key. This is the business of architecture. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and I'm one of your hosts here on the Business of Architecture podcast, where we discuss and you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a more profitable and impactful architectural practice. Today, there's an unprecedented opportunity as firm leaders are retiring from their practices, long established practices with wonderful portfolios. There is what we might call a leadership vacuum. And in this leadership vacuum, there are a lot of opportunities for younger practitioners to step into leadership roles. Today, we talk with Erica Moody. She's the current president of the International Interior Design Association, which, as you may know, is the equivalent of the AIA for interior design professionals. She is also the president of Helix Architecture and Design, a nationally recognized architectural and interior design firm with offices in Kansas City and Denver. Erica has a very interesting story where she went from working for a large firm to going out and starting her own firm with a partner and then eventually merging with Helix Architecture and Design. So in today's episode, you'll get a fantastic primer on what to think about if you're considering merging with another practice, or perhaps you're a larger, you're a principal at a larger practice looking to acquire another firm, all the challenges and the opportunities that come along with two firms merging for a successful transition. So with that, I welcome Erica Moody to the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Erica, help us just help give our, give our audience a little bit of context for how you ended up as the president of Helix Design. If you can give us a little bit of background on what brought you to this current opportunity. Sure, sure. Uh, my background, probably like many others, started in a, uh, an architecture and interior design firm um, that, that grew over time. And I was able to see and, and do a lot of different aspects of really the business of design. Um, it took me to a place in my career where actually I was able to jump out on my own. And I started my own practice with a, with a fellow partner of mine. Um, that practice was running successfully. And as you often do, you reach out to peers and people that have been there and done that before you. And I was talking with the founders of Helix and we were having good discussions of sort of the days gone by of starting your own practice and, and what, what that all entails. And um, that conversation kind of continued and we started talking about design synergies and philosophies of business and, and really values that aligned. And so we started talking about partnering on projects. Uh, that partnership quickly turned into, hey, what if we started to do this at a maybe larger scale and think about a merger of some sort? Um, my predecessors are about 15 years my senior, and they were looking um, at, you know, for quite a few options and opportunities of how to transition their practice and really kind of move beyond and wanted to see it succeed beyond generation one. And so we entered into a host of conversations that ultimately led to that merger. Um, and part of that was to, to be the transition. So in that conversation, we talked about equity. We talked about um, gaining more, you know, investment into Helix. And also what would that mean for my practice to fold into and how would we grow beyond? And so that's really sort of how it started. Um, that that transition is now complete for us. And I've been at the presidency that going on, I think this is my third or fourth year, I sometimes lose track. Um, and so it was successful for us, but it really did start in uh, in very much a 
purposeful conversation about what would transition look like both for my practice as a new and up and coming uh, firm and then Helix, which is 25 year uh, already very rooted in the community. practice. And for our listeners, as you're listening, uh, what Erica just shared with us may, I mean, look, let's face it. She spoke for two minutes and talked a, ver a very condensed summary <laughs> of a very challenging process right yes. having uh, you know here at business of architecture we've seen participated in and seen a lot of these a lot of these transitions either generational transitions where the retiring firm owners are looking to hand it on to new members i can't say that there's been a very many instances where i've seen people brought in from the outside so mm -hmm. that in and of itself is remarkable because it's different and mm -hmm. I look forward to, you know, shedding as much light as we can on this, Erica, for our listeners today. Sure. Now, how, when did you step directly into a partnership or principal position with the firm when you came on board? I did, yes. Um, we very much um, saw it as a two plus two equals more than, right? Or a one plus one equals three um, is the more, I guess, more appropriate way to say that. Um, so we saw the valuation of where Helix was and my previous firm. Um, and we really put those two together. And because our markets hadn't uh, overlapped a lot and our client list didn't overlap a lot, we really saw it as a growth opportunity. So um, we became about 20% of that whole, if you will. So we kind of, at that point, we we reevaluated, um, we restructured, and my partner and I of the firm joining became uh, shareholders and, and equity partners at day one. Um, really bringing our own book of business, if you will, and the value that it held as part of that part of that greater sum of the parts. Um, we also, with that, identified and stepped out a transition over the next four years that would get us into some milestone positions, whether that be 50% equity or super majority equity, sort of per our shareholder agreement, so that we know we knew going in this was intentional and this was to be the transition. And we didn't have it all laid out at the beginning. We didn't know exactly how it was going to unfold. We purposefully knew there would need to be other partners added. And, and luckily for me, the two partners that I have today both joined after that merger had occurred. Um, so there was a little bit of still that unknown, but, but at least the beginning sort of um, roadmap, if you will, was set out that this was, this was intentional. And yes, we did come in. Um, we did come in as shareholders and, and principals in the practice from day one. Having gone through the process, are there any specific things that you advise people to look out for, any gotchas, like make sure that you do this. If you go through this process, you got to think about this. Yeah. Yeah, there are. Um, I think the valuations wisely was uh, mentioned to me that they really are sort of um, what someone will pay, right? So you can assume and you can uh, track and you can follow any kind of benchmark rules, but at the end of the day, your practice is worth what somebody's willing to to give you for it. Um, and so I think that was helpful in both cases, right? Because you could be someone in practice five years or 25 years, but depending on your momentum, your trajectory, where they saw sort of your up, you know, your 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 uh, uh, upsell, if you will, your opportunity to be that, that was that was something to take into account. So I think keeping an open mind, evaluations can be done a lot of different ways, and there's going to probably be most of your conversations around that. And so not getting too locked into something and feeling like this is the only way, this is what somebody said, this has to be it, and, and really digging in that there are a lot of nuances. And I think recognizing that was 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 beneficial. Um, there are things and agreements, this is a minor, but every business is gonna have certain contractual obligations, whether they're leases or they are, contracts with other vendors that you want to make sure you go through. I think sometimes those can be a little bit later on down the list and maybe get uh, rubber stamped a bit, but they do come back, not so much gotchas, but they do come back to be things you will inherit and need to carry forward to the duration of that contract. And so it is good to understand kind of where your position would be. And is that the same way you might negotiate it? Is it an antiquated contract that maybe just needs to be reevaluated? Is this the time to sort of pull, you know, pull the plug on it and just tell that particular vendor, uh, we're going through something here and we need to reevaluate. And so that would have been maybe something easier to, to step into as opposed to kind of inheriting things and, and maybe finding that out later. And then the third thing that I, um, that comes to mind is really how intensely emotional a transition is. And I think giving time and credit to that 
for us, these were founders. These were principals that stepped out on their own and did this. And this was what they created. This was their baby. So it's only, you know, it's only going to be under, it's completely understandable that there are a lot of emotions tied to that. You're also asking somebody to do this at the end of their career in our case. So this wasn't somebody that was just moving on to another venture. This was retirement and you don't stop being an architect or a designer just because you're not collecting that paycheck or that distribution anymore. And so recognizing that there was maybe some internal personal time that people needed to take, whether that was how it was announced. That was what it meant to them, how their titling was, how they wanted it publicly. And giving grace to that, I think, was was a good thing we did, we were able to do. Um, and I would give that to anybody going forward. It's just don't underestimate that that's going to come with emotions. And they show up in all kinds of ways on both sides. But uh, but definitely just kind of recognizing that that's, that's, that's a part of the deal. It's not all cut and dried business. <laughs> mm. How did you manage the nuance of those emotions? It's I'd like a little more detail on that. It sounds like there was maybe some different ways things were announced or what, what actually did that look like in practice? Certainly, certainly. I think um, communication is always going to be key. So clarity and understanding, there are things that have deadlines. There are things that people on both sides are not going to hold on forever for a decision to be made. Uh, if a transition is imminent, no one wants to sit in the second seat forever if that's you know where it's eventually going to be driving towards. And so I think having conversations around um, both sides sort of understanding it may be difficult for someone to step out. It also is something somebody's ready to step into. And so I think where we maybe had successes were um, some one-on-one -on -one sessions. So I know for my predecessor who was in the president's role, he was the founder of the firm. Um, we would meet monthly. And that first year after I took over the presidency, it was my ask of him that we meet outside of work, off, you know, kind of off turf, if you will, but that we just do quick little debrief. How's it going for you? How's it going for us? What am I seeing and dealing with? What are you seeing and dealing with? And that we could have that open dialogue. We did those about six or seven months and we didn't really need to do them anymore, but I appreciated his time post transition to be able to do that and willing to do that. Pre-transition, there were times when I could tell uh, very positively uh, he might sit back and not respond or sort of wait for Gen 2. We like to call ourselves Gen 1, Gen 2. It just made it a little easier. Uh, Gen 2 to respond to things. And I could tell that that was a very respectful place he was being to say, why don't you guys, you guys are taking this forward, come up with it. If we needed it or we wanted it and we wanted to hear how it had been done before, they were certainly there to talk about it. But we tried, we really tried hard to almost take out of the dialogue, this is the way it's always been done, because we were recognizing that moving forward, we wanted to do some things differently. And it was an opportunity for us to do so. Um, I think each one, we had three founding shareholders and a fourth partner, each one retired on a little bit different timeline. Some of them were more age driven or um, insurance and benefit driven. And we were able to take those into account and be mindful of timelines that each one had. Um, some were able to step down maybe in a more, um, a, a little bit of a slower way where they went in four days, three days, you know, down that way. And that was more comfortable for them. Others sort of wanted just one day to come in and one day not. So I think just even being able to let each person have a little bit of flexibility on how they did that. And then you mentioned publicly, that was also something we've talked to each one and sort of said, how do you want this announced in the trade magazines, if you will, or in the business journal? Um, what do you want us to say? Because it's an exciting time and we've been very public about the transition of Helix, but for each one individually, they all have connected community roles that they're still participating in. And so just how sort of they want that um, message to be, to be relayed was something we talked a lot about. Um, one of the more fun ideas I think we had was to say, is there anything you haven't done and anything in this sort of 12 months leading up to retirement or that last day? Is there any particular thing you wanted to be a part of? Um, we've been fortunate to have some really fantastic projects in these, these times of transition. And I think each one sort of hung their hat on one that was maybe really special to them. And so letting them, uh, not that they wouldn't have already been in a driver's seat position for that, but just having that ability to sort of celebrate those and, and be able to uh, go out with that high, um, for, for a great career, for a great career. So um, that, that, was, that was fun to be able to do. You mentioned at the beginning um, that this isn't always easy. It's not. And so uh, I think a firm uh, statement or sort of 
philosophy I guess I have is that kindness is clarity. And so if there were times that were tough and I could be clear about decisions that had to be made or t difficult situations that were not being addressed, we would try to hit those head on. Um, we meet as a shareholder group every week for breakfast. When I first joined Helix, I thought that was a lot. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of, uh, of together, you know, as I've realized, it's probably what's our secret sauce because there will be times you come and you've maybe had a tension situation and you do face each other every week and you eat breakfast and you drink coffee and you have that conversation and you go over that. And if it is, if it is a little bit touchy or problematic, I think that one of the best things we've always been able to do is address it and not bury it, not go hide away and not see a coworker or a colleague for weeks on end. But uh, that has been, that has been really helpful to us. So yeah, those, those, those things sometimes, like I said, they bring up emotion. They can, they can be pretty raw at times and, and you do, you do sort of give people that grace, but you also have to move at a deadline pace and you've got to uh, have decisions made. So we did, we did just that. Yeah. Erica, I'm, I'm having this mental image in my head right now. We were camping a couple of months ago here in Central mm -hmm. California, and there was these two rivers that come together. And as these two rivers merged, there was little eddies that would spin off, and they would just kind mm -hmm. of float around mm -hmm. like that. And one, one river was going slower. It was wider, and the other river was faster. And so there was a bunch of disharmony as these two flows merged. And then as they became one further on down, you could never tell there was ever uh, two, different, mm -hmm. uh, two different rivers. And I'm curious, as 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 your design firm that you were a partner in merged with helix mm -hmm. how rocky was that and i guess that's a that's a very um broad kind of scale it's not like we can say mm -hmm. zero to ten but would you say that it was a fairly easy transition in terms of the culture people brought you know people accept you with open arms so finally you know, here's Erica and her partner descending from the heavens to help save us. Um, or was it more like, oh, geez, wow, they're doing things differently. Uh, what were sure. what were some of the cultural challenges that you faced? That's, that's great. I know that's a great question. Um, I've been through a couple transitions. In my own practice. I'll, I'll kind of dive into that one. Um, you mentioned that bringing somebody in from the outside is a little unique. So I think Helix probably just to, just for just sort of set it up. Helix had been through uh, some internal suggestions of transition, maybe even tried some people in different roles and, and places and parts to some success and maybe some, some not. And so I think there was a willingness by Helix and leadership, so shareholders and their general leadership to really seek this sort of outside. So coming into it, they were already embracing the idea. So I think that helps because if the context had been, gosh, we've got six people lined up here ready for these promotional spots, you're going to bring somebody out from the inside in, that, that's tougher. That's a tougher tension there. But that was not so much the case for their side. For our side, we were an up-and-coming firm that had brought people over with us that believed in us, believed in what we were doing, and I think really enjoyed the entrepreneurial spirit that a small firm provided them. So in some cases, this opportunity to go to a larger recognized resources that we didn't have as a small sort of startup, uh, that was great. We had an accountant, we had somebody in business development, we had people that did IT. Okay, those are great things, but there was some, you know, just casualness about six, eight people being in studio together. And now you're going to go to 30. There was some casualness about, you know, I think on Thursday, we're going to all duck out and go do a project tour. And that sort of worked when you're a small studio, uh, larger it was a little more scheduled or a little more, you know, that. And so, you know, those things don't always translate for everybody the same way. Um, personalities, you're right. They're always going to have to kind of find their, their place. I think we were doing all right. And I think we would have maybe even done better than all right. Um, but we did have a hiccup and I liked your metaphor, you know, the eddies, I can see that. I can definitely see the first one was for my partner. My partner decided sort of midway about a year and a half into the merger that this just really wasn't for him. And when I say that, I don't think it was about my previous practice or, or Helix. I think owning a practice was maybe something that um, was tried. Um, there was time spent definitely doing that, but for him, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, he's a great friend and, and colleague to this day, but 
fantastic designer. And so being able to step back into a 100% design role was very appealing. So he actually left Helix at that point. And that then also sort of put into place maybe some questioning of, well, did everything go the way they wanted this merger to go? Did we see everything successfully the way we wanted it to? And so for for any of and all of those reasons, you can kind of see where that's that adds a little bit of that unease or that um, that questioning in folks' minds. And so we did definitely have some attrition on both sides. I think you you always will. I mentioned I've been through some previous transitions. I think there is almost a tipping point where the firm, the new firm, the collective new firm, has to almost have fifty percent or more not the old, not this one, not that one, but together new. And there sort of seems to be this nice sort of uh, ease. Maybe that's where the water starts to calm down a little bit. And it takes you a minute to get there. I would say, so, you know, for those times, um, that's there. Now, as far as being welcomed with open arms, we could not have walked into a better situation. They truly were excited for us to come in. And I think even um, would admit that it sort of gave a jolt of energy. It gave a, a new design focus and voice. There were people that were questioning what's going to happen when our leaders do want to retire, and there didn't seem to be a very clear transition. So that also was unease on the Helix side of things. And so to see a group come in and be able to fill that, announce that, support that, that was that was very well um, welcomed to 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 your point. Um, so. Goods and bads. Um, I'm not sure that there's any one thing we could have mitigated differently, um, because honestly, those things are going to happen, and people they need to make choices in their lives for them and their family. And I don't think us trying to script it, it'll never, it'll never write the way it'll never write, it'll never play out the way you wrote it. So I'd rather stay adaptable and be, you know, honest and upfront about what you're trying to get out of it, and we'll 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 move. We'll, we'll stay adaptable. How was the process announced to the current team members? Was this something where there was visioning ahead of time or was it just a team mm -hmm. meeting? Hey, by the way, this is what we're doing. Can you tell me mm -hmm. how it was prefaced? Sure. Yeah, no, it was a several month process. Um, not only did my partner and I need to get used to the fact, because again, this wasn't something we had ventured out on our own to then merge right away. So we had to get pretty comfortable with uh, giving up the name, the, the the thing that you created, that that sort of uh, piece of it as well. For us on our side and our team being a little bit smaller, we brought everybody together for a team meeting, we had a great rooftop deck. We brought everybody upstairs and we talked about it. I think they probably knew more just being in a small studio that something was was sort of a, you know, going on. Had um, you told them maybe, or was that something that they had just kind of overhearing some wins through the phone calls yeah and... yeah um probably not phone calls we were meeting pretty regularly off site but being out of the office um we had said without any kind of hesitation we're looking to partner with helix and we may be looking at some project pursuits and things which in the beginning was in fact the the the, the process and that really was what we were undertaking um until it was time to really update everyone and we knew more what it was going to be we sort of kept it at that, kept it at sort of that place. We did bring in one of our architects to some conversations there. Um, but I did want to have more of the answers because I knew the first questions would be, are we moving over there? What does it look like? What do our titles mean? Who are they? What, who do they have? What, you know, what projects are we going to work on? So we wanted to have things in place that at least could answer those questions. Um, I think the Helix team, I wasn't there, but I think the Helix team did something similar. And then when we finally brought everyone together, we uh, got together at a local project actually that Helix had designed for one of our uh, Kansas City homegrown breweries. And we rented out a space and we did have a presentation and we talked a lot about um, the portfolio of both practices and some of the things that I mentioned in the beginning made a lot of sense from us, shared values, aligned philosophies, and really where we saw this growing and going. And so you did, we did map out a vision for the group, took an afternoon and spent that, and then really gave a good bulk of that time to just letting people interact and get to know one another um, and, and just be social together. Wow. So many great leadership principles from this example of taking stock of the uh, existing team cultures, making sure that a, a proper vision is cast so that people can get excited and they can feel like this mm -hmm. is an opportunity for them, a possibility. 
And I didn't mention it, but we also had um, done quite a bit of work about how we wanted to announce this publicly too. So, you know, small videos, uh, announcements ready to go, things like that had been thought through. So we had brought on our, our business development and marketing team into the fold um, earlier than the, than the full announcement so that that can be done too. Erica, how did you come to the decision that this was a go for you? Because I can imagine, um, you know, understanding the culture, it's a big jump. I mean, obviously it's pot, you could pull the parachute strings and bail out later. So it's not a irreversible decision, mm -hmm. but no one jumps, goes into something like this lightly. So I'm mm -hmm. curious for your decision-making process. Number one, are you a pretty quick decision maker or what was it that allowed you to say, okay, I'm all in on this. Let's move ahead. Great question. Um, the, two things. Um, the decision to start my own practice probably was even more of a risk. So we didn't talk about that so much up to this point, but my partner and I left a practice, a very well-established practice, about 200 people. Um, and we had led a marketplace there of 15 or so, and we were working on some of the most high profile projects in Kansas city and the area. Um, and, and all practical purposes pretty much had our pick of what we wanted to do, but there was still an expectation on our part that there there might be, and, and we wanted to sort of see what what more there could be out there. So that decision was by far the the most risky and probably the toughest decision I had made. Um, I mentioned that because I think once you've done that and you've seen it through and you survived and the paycheck came back on eventually and projects came in, um, the opportunity to join with Helix, I took on a little more excitedly. Not that I wasn't excited about the other, but there was still a lot of trepidation. This time it felt like we can actually take what we've done and what we've seen happen in a short four or five years. And with the resources and the backbone specifically, we can go from being six people to 30 people overnight. We can go from taking, you know, a majority of our time spent on some of these things and really start to have resources. Again, I mentioned accounting, HR, finance, those sorts of things that would support us. And what more could we do with that? And so um, that primarily made the decision for me. Um, that alone would not have been enough, but seeing that the leaders in Helix and knowing their portfolio, respecting the work that they had previously done and hearing them actively say, this is where we want to link arms and do this in a partnership way. We, we just honestly saw it fast forwarding what we were already trying to do and hoping to do. Um, and so it was, again, like you do with so many things, you go through that plus and minus and pros and cons, but at the end of the day, it definitely outweighed any concerns we had um, and that was simply to be able to do to do more, to do more of the projects we love, to be able to work with more, you know, talented people. Um, and so that decision, that's that's how we came to that decision was really just that it fast forwarded us um, well beyond what we thought we could get to in the first 10 years of our practice. Knowing what you know, what advice would you give to firms that merge for those initial days, maybe the first six months or so that you think you just got to keep this in mind? Mm hmm. Um, we talked about it earlier. The culture is incredibly important, maybe number one. Um, the projects will happen. The clients will figure out where to go. They'll understand a name change, you know, some of those things that um, that might be maybe more front and center at the beginning. But the culture is, is really important. So checking in with your people and making sure that your key uh, your key leaders understand. And if they don't fully embrace it or aren't fully on board, keep talking about it. Keep talking to them about what are their concerns, what's working, what's not. Um, and, and checking in, I think, and then truly actively listening to their concerns and not just giving lip service or some sort of marketing spiel that this is all going to be okay, but truly, truly listening to that. Um, the other advice I would say, and this kind of goes for both sides, someone gave this advice to me and I think it was good. And that is from a leader's seat, especially in a, in a leader's seat that I was in taking the, the reins, if you will, after a, a couple of years, sitting back and observing for a couple of months and kind of keeping your mouth shut is also not a bad way to do it because there are a lot of things you can learn from interpersonal dynamics or maybe the way it's always been done, but maybe you do start to see a little about what makes them tick, secret sauce, whatever, or things you want to change. But if you come hard charge in day one and sort of say, these are all the things I do, this is what we do, this is how we do it, 
you miss an opportunity to preserve some really special and impactful parts of who they are. The breakfast for one, I would say. My first reaction, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of this. I don't know that we need that. After we'd gone through and done that for a while, I realized, no, this is something we'll always do. So I, I do think that's also a good, a good advice. So I suppose in both cases, listening more than you're speaking is probably good um, for the leadership side of things, for sure. And then actively just talking to your folks because they know, they know what's going on and they're going to hear what the concerns are and you're going to be able to address that in a much more positive way um, straight from them. So Ricky, it seems like you've done some of the hard work, which is the merger part of it. What are the opportunities that you see now moving forward? I oh, appreciate that. It um, it does come with some great opportunities. I think for for Doug and Alyssa, my partners now, and I, um, Helix has an incredible reputation. We have an incredible backstory and trajectory, or well, actually we have an incredible uh, a backstory of projects that we've been a part of. And so being handed that portfolio and the responsibility that goes with those clients and maintaining those relationships is obviously incredible. Um, that also affords us the ability to take that and grow it beyond. And so jumping off right now at a place where you already are established and you already have that, I think is, uh, is, is a great opportunity. Uh, we do have now our Denver office and we continue to push west. We have a project in Salt Lake City and we'll continue to see our markets. Uh, that primarily is in our multifamily market, but our higher education market and our workplace markets are going to continue to push us into other areas. Is. Our goal right now is to bring the best projects we can bring in for our team to work on. We feel like that is where we offer the best opportunity for the people that come to work for Helix and for the clients that are here. So for us to be able to do that, Kansas City certainly has always been and will always be our major market. That is where we are headquartered. That is where we have the bulk majority of our project work. But if we can continue to drive projects like we've seen in Kansas City and other markets, and that affords us the ability to bring in sophisticated and complex projects for our team to work on, that is our goal moving forward. So not so much growth in the sense of more people, but growth in the sense of projects and where those project opportunities being somewhat agnostic to that as far as location. Oh. Eric has been great. Uh, hopefully a, a very good primer for anyone who's looking at this kind of merger. And of course, we'll Appreciate include it. all the information about your firm on the website where people can go to the show notes and see the link to the website uh, for additional information. Excellent. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap. Hey, Enix Sears here. And I, I have a request since you are a listener here of the Business of Architecture podcast. Ryan and I, we love putting this podcast together. We love sharing information as much as we can glean from all the other industries that we're a part of to bring it back to empower you as an architect and a designer. And one thing that helps us in our mission is the growth of this podcast, simply because it helps other architects stand for more of their value, spreads the business information that we're sharing to empower architects together. So architects, designers, engineers can really step into their greatness, whatever that looks like for each individual. And so here, my, my simple ask is for you to join us and be part of our community by doing the following, heading over to iTunes and leaving a review of the podcast. And as an expression of our sincere thanks, we would like to give you a free CEU course that can get you one professional development unit, but more importantly, will give you a very solid and firm foundation on your journey to becoming a profitable and thriving architect. So here's the process for that. After you leave us a review, send an email to support at businessofarchitecture.com. Let us know the username that you use to leave the review, and we will send you that free training. On the training, you'll discover what 99% of architecture firm owners wish they would have known 20 years ago. And the other 1%, well, they just didn't even know that they didn't know. Head over to iTunes and leave us a review now. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. 
So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.